Uh, my name is uh, Watson Warner, and uh, I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, and I uh, <clears throat> attended the uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, which is known as Virginia Tech, and I graduated there in 1938 with a BS degree in chemical engineering. Uh, the depression was on, and jobs were very hard to find, but it wouldn't believe it, DuPont did finally hire me in February 1939 uh, in the engineering department. So I went to work for DuPont here in Wilmington, but I went to work over, I was actually working at the Chambers work, but I was a part of the engineering department. Uh, wonderful place to work, we made everything lead, tetraethyl lead, alcohol, synthetic rubber, which is neoprene, I worked in the neoprene plant. Everything was going along fine. <clears throat> 1940 comes along, war clouds are gathering very seriously, and the British and French Purging Commission has prevailed on uh, the government to build a powder plant for them, a gun powder plant uh, on the, for them. DuPont was asked to do this, and so right away, Japan accepted the job, and it's going to turn out to be the Tennessee Powder Company, going to be built 25 miles north of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, called, and uh, so they grabbed up about five of us young uh, engineers. I'm chemical, the others were either chemical or mechanical. They weren't civil, and they put us into the construction division, transferred us to Memphis in the construction division, June of 1940. And they put us in uh, positions, uh, assistant division engineers, assistants to seasoned construction men. I ended up being assistant division engineer in the acid area. And this is an area uh, that takes ammonia and converts it to uh, nitric acid by the oxidation of ammonia. And then we concentrate that acid from 62% nitric to 90%. And that is what they used to nitrate uh, what was cotton linter, spelled L-I-N-T-N-E-R-S, little short vowels of cotton. And you, that is what gunpowder consists of. And it's gunpowder for big cannons and rifles and that type of thing. Also at that plant, we, they'd put in two lines of TNT, which also requires nitric acid because it's trinitrotoluene. Uh, Hercules, uh, DuPont came under the Sherman Antitrust Law, uh, which I believe was in 1912, and was broken up into Hercules and Atlas powder and DuPont. So that's the way Atlas came about, uh, I mean, uh, Hercules came about. Uh, it was about, uh, when they did the breakup, I think it was about half the size of, uh, uh, of DuPont, and Atlas was about the half the size of Hercules. <laughs> it was just, uh, the, the, the gunpowder we're making was for all military, what we call military explosives. And uh, uh, what we were doing, we, the, the companies were entirely separated uh, back years before I started to work for them. As a matter of fact, with the, the control by law, the DuPont could not have anything to do with Hercules and vice versa. Uh, so uh, everything that we uh, are manufacturing, we're going now, we're embarking now. Let me, let me get back to my original story. Uh, the, uh, uh, we started work in uh, June. It, was, it turned out to be really a small Manhattan project because it was dire need to get this material. DuPont, uh, the U.S. government did not did not have very much uh, military explosive, and so uh, we got everything we needed to do on this plant. It was a thirty million dollar plant, which was a lot of money in 1940. And uh, of course, the depression was still on. We had no problem in, uh, in getting good men to build this plant. This is June 1940 when we were driving concrete piles to erect a powerhouse in which we generated our own electricity. And by December, we had this plant up and were nitrating uh, cotton litters in December. In six months, we were producing powder. Uh, the thing of it, in September of 1940, France fell. They capitulated to the Germans. So the British and French Purchase Commission no longer existed. The United States took this over on a, what they call a Lend-Lease. That was the beginning of Lend-Lease. And they changed it, not changed the name to the Chickasaw Ordnance Works. 
and from then on it operated. Uh, it was a government-owned plant. Uh, DuPont just designed, built it, and operated it for the U.S. government, like they did every ensuing plant I'm going to talk about. Now, they did the same way, including the big Manhattan district. It was all done, designed, built, and operated by DuPont. And they, for one dollar, the contract for doing this was one dollar for each one of these plants, which uh, over the period of time we're talking about here, 1940 through 1944, uh, you're talking, uh, uh, I don't know, a dozen and a half plants, at least. Did so they got, they got a dollar. For, for, for each plant or for each, each plant? plant, they got a dollar. Uh, okay, so, so the way this worked was? This, uh, the plant was designed, built, and operated completely by DuPont people. Okay. Uh, the government was done, being done by the government. There were government people located on the plant, but they uh, had little to do with the design, uh, construction, and operation of the plant. This was 99.9% uh, DuPont, and we maintained that all through the war. <laughs> right. Uh, because they, the government by that time knew that DuPont was very, very expert at what they did, and so we, uh, we had a free reign to do what we did, or want, or do what we had to do, and we did it. So I went from, uh, we completed that job uh, uh, in, uh, the, at the end of 1940. Now the war has gotten very bad. I mean, uh, the, the war clouds are, are terrible. And uh, so now our construction division is being split up into kind of a two, two bunches. And the crowd that I was going to be with, we went to the Alabama, went down to Childersburg, Alabama, about 50 miles south of Birmingham, to build the Alabama Ordnance Works in a nothing but a, but a big red clay cornfield. By the end, uh, and here again, we were going to have a, a smoker's powder. Uh, plant like we did in Memphis, and also some TNT lines, tritonitrotitanine for bombs. And uh, we got away with that in, uh, uh, by January 41, and we completed that by the end of the year. Uh, it was all up and running and producing. Uh, I, get, I then get transferred from there <clears throat> up to the Wabash River Ordnance Works, a beautiful cornfield on condemned to farm, farmland. And uh, here we're going to have a, a, a nitric acid plant, like we have at every one of these sites, because you need nitric acid all of them. Yeah, so at the Wabash River Ordnance Works, which where, is where was that? Look 25 right. miles north of Terre Haute, at a place called Newport, Indiana, on the Wabash River, on the Wabash River, because they need river water to keep everything cool, and. Uh, now we have to have a nitric acid plant, at which I was a division engineer. I was in charge of the erection of uh, this big uh, nitric acid plant and the concentration of the acid. And now we're going to nitrate hexamine, and we're going to produce, commercially produce plastic explosives for the first time in the world. And this is an awful material that the terrorists today use, but uh, this is why we did it. Uh, nitrating hexamine. Uh, I was in charge of the acid area there, and uh, then the plant went into production uh, about uh, September of 40, uh, it's 1941, uh, two, 1942. And uh, they transferred me uh, out of construction to be unbelievable at this young age. I was called chief engineer in charge of operating maintenance. That I was in charge of maintenance for the acid plant and the two nitrating lines where we actually took the acid and nitrated the hexamine to make uh, a material we called RDX. But I think today, in some, in some cases, it's called C4, but it is plastic explosive. And the, we, the Allies really wanted, we want, really wanted this material because it turned out very well to be used in what we call blockbuster bombs. And <laughs> So that was the beginning of that. Uh, I was uh, in this job of chief engineer of uh, maintenance there. I've uh, been in that job for about four months. Uh, in January of 1943, I got summoned up to the plant manager's office uh, uh, in, uh, on a Monday morning. 
and he handed me a telegram. Uh, and, uh, I said, his name happened to be Walter O. Simon, S-I-M-O-N. He was the plant manager there, and as the story will end, uh, end in a little while, he is going to end up being the plant manager of the Hanford Engineer Works, which is a plant, the giant plant that we, uh, I'm going to talk about this later. But anyway, uh, Walter Simon, Walt Simon handed me this telegram. It was from E.G. Ackert, and it said, Watson Warren is to report to the engineering department at once. And I said, Walter, uh, what's this? He said, Watson, I don't know. We've been informed by the Wilmington management that uh, a big project, secret project, is underway, and if personnel is requested through normal channels, the person is to be made available at once. So here it is, and your job is over here. <laughs> get on, get out of here tomorrow. Now here it is in late January, snow on the ground, ice on the ground. Were you married yet? I was not married. I did not get married until 1945. Uh, so I'm a bachelor, but not no problem. You could pack up and move in a hurry. I had a 1940 Ford convertible coupe, which I'd bought in Memphis. I paid $1,100 for this, most expensive car that Ford produced at that time. Uh, his uh, his uh, sedan, four-door sedan, cost $750. So I had this convertible coupe. It had a heater, uh, a radio, and an automatic top, and a horse a uh, horse uh, leather for seats, it was a, a, a jump seat. Uh, so anyway, uh, how, how can I, I said, well, how can I drive this uh, to Wilmington? I mean, it's snow and ice on the ground. I gotta go all through Pittsburgh and everything. There's no interstates or nothing. Nobody salted any roads in those days. So he calls in the transportation department, uh, uh, manager of the transportation department. He said, look, uh, Watson is to be on the Spear of St. Louis tomorrow. It's a fast train on the Pennsylvania Railroad from St. Louis to Philadelphia, all Pullman train, and you put his car uh, on, a, on a freight train and ship it to Wilmington. So that's what they did. So I showed up in Wilmington, uh, and uh, this was late January, right around February the 1st, and uh, we, 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 the engineering department, which I had been a member of before, so uh, they, we entered this, this group of us in a uh, room, and they gradually began to tell us what, what, what we were going to do. And the first thing is it's going to be a, a highly confidential secret job, and that we were going to be given a Q clearance. And we, get, in order to have a Q clearance, we needed that because we will need to know things about this project that will be denied other people. So they clearly made, made this very clear to us. They read us, uh, I believe, it was a statement. I believe it was the Espionage Act of 1938. It was something like that. It was a law. And uh, they read this to us. You had to read it yourself. They, they had witnesses there to see that you read this. And then you signed a statement that you fully understood this and would, you would b abide by this. And it was witnessed by, these are all DuPont people, witnessed by that. So now you are under a sworn testimony here that you are not going to reveal to anyone information that you are made uh, privy to on this project. Uh, uh, so what, th this is the way we, they, we edited the, the, this group, and it was about five or six of them in my particular group. I knew these f fellows from past jobs we'd been on. And uh, they are now going to distribute us uh, into the design division of the DuPont uh, Engineering Department, which is located on the 13th floor of the Nemours Building, which the company even no longer owns. And it became known uh, around as Shangri-La, <laughs> because no one was permitted uh, into that area. This is where all the confidential drawing, the drawing rooms are there, all, all confidential. It was under surveillance all the time. And as a matter of fact, even on the 13th floor of the DuPont building, uh, they came around and sealed the locks on every window, even though it was on. A, and during the day, several times a day, uh, we, I was working in the office there uh, on this uh, uh, project, these guards would come around and check the seals. These are the window seals on the lock on the 13th floor. And to make sure that uh, nobody had 
that was aiming on leaving this area, even if we even on, on a, through a 13th floor window. <laughs> so, um, uh, getting back to the Clarence uh, thing again, uh, the only two people, the only people I know that died on account of revealing stuff uh, on the bomb were the Rosenbergs, who were worked at uh, Los Alamos and made information on the bomb design to Canadian spies, which ended up uh, in foreign hands. And of course, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Rosenberg, unfortunately, were electric put to death for that revelation. Now, this is what we knew. This happened long after we had signed this, but they had signed the same piece of paper, and that's what happened to them. So it was a well-guarded secret. And uh, so right away they put me into the design division, and uh, I started work under, under senior engineers. I was a young engineer, and under senior engineers, and the first thing that we, they wanted, uh, we would do, to do was we are going to design three heavy water plants. And uh, you do this by, Heavy water occurs in nature. I think it's one part in every 16,000 parts of water is heavy water. You've been drinking heavy water all your life. <laughs> uh, it's exactly the way it occurs in nature uh, that way. And what you do is you, 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 just, you just distill steam and, and separate it. That's the way we did it, fractionating steam. The plants were, that, we, uh, had, uh, that we built were just a series of big, tall columns. Looked like an oil refinery, except that uh, the first, uh, the first column we put up was a field erected 15 feet in diameter, and it was 100 feet high with bubble trays and everything in, uh, inside of it. And the next one down in size, what came out of the top of that went into the bottom of the next one, uh, as I recall, it was 12 foot 6. And then from then on, uh, the columns could all be fabricated on plant and shipped in by train. You might have to put them on a couple of flat cars to get them in. But we built uh, 